welcome into the Practicing 101 Masterclass. Now in this class, guys, I'm gonna be showing you how to structure uh, one hour of practice. Now, of course, you might have more time than that to practice or way less time, it just depends on the day. But either way, these methods can be stretched to fit whatever time frame you have to work within. Now, I get a lot of questions about practice because I think that we all know deep down that if we get good at practicing, we can get better faster. But the reality is that practicing kind of always sucks. We can definitely get better at the skill of practicing, but I wanna say right off the bat that practicing will always be somewhat uncomfortable by nature. So before we get into the structure of this hour, I wanted to go over five of my practicing philosophies with you, just so we're on the same page about what we're working towards today. Practice philosophy number one, practice happens when we are struggling. The discomfort that you likely feel when you're attempting to play something that you can't yet play, that's exactly what practice feels like. And in reality, it doesn't feel that good. Learning to truly practice is like going to the gym for the first time. We're lifting heavy weights, we're sweating profusely, we're out of breath, we smell bad, and at some point you're probably gonna ask yourself, why the hell am I doing this? This is absolutely terrible. And the reason you're feeling this way in that first gym session is because you haven't yet woken up the reward system in your brain. Your mind is telling you, hey man, I'm not getting anything out of this that makes me wanna stay here. Why are we still doing this? But the thing is, your reward system and your mind, it's just looking for that instant gratification. Your brain wants ice cream and pizza and sex and laughter and all these other things that give us that quick dopamine, serotonin, endorphin, or an adrenaline hit. So when you're in the gym or in the practice, room, you have to remember that you aren't going to experience a reward in that room necessarily. We're putting our body and our mind through these difficult things because we know that there's a huge reward coming our way if we can just get through the shitty part now. Just like in the gym, practice is supposed to be hard and it's likely that you won't enjoy practicing every time you do it. I think many of us need a reminder that this feeling is totally normal and that it's our job to quite simply tough it out and do the work. Now, of course, practice isn't just pure misery. There is definitely a dopamine hit in the practice room when you finally succeed at something that you've been trying to nail for a while. And if you're in your first year of drumming, there can still be this, this fascination with new patterns uh, and exploring new sounds and just figuring things out. And trust me, I'm not trying to rob you of that early curiosity. You should ride that wave as long as you can. But for me, I just like to be a realist and remind myself that practice is, uh, it's just very hard and oftentimes unenjoyable. But I take a lot of pride in persevering through that window of difficulty because I know that there's a huge reward on the other side of all of this hard work. That kind of applies to everything, by the way. Practice philosophy number two, we need to separate the idea of practice into three different modes, studying, practicing, and playing. Now we're gonna dive deeper into all of these concepts, but I wanted to give you a quick overview now. So studying is the idea or the mental mode of simply focusing on the cognitive part of practice. When you watch a YouTube lesson and you aren't at the kit, to me, that's studying. We're inputting data into our brain and we're starting to process all this new information. So this could be counting out loud. Uh, it maybe could be tapping something out on your lap or just thinking about what a new pattern or a new groove might sound like. Studying could even be listening to music as long as you are actively listening. Now, I believe in setting aside uh, specific times just for studying where we focus on only inputting data in our mind, and then we move on to practice after this. Now, practicing is the physical action of teaching your body how to do something new. This is what we usually think of when we say the word practice. So we're at the drum set, in the trenches, working out new patterns and ideas, and this is where the real struggle takes place and where the hardest work usually goes down. True practice is the most demanding because it requires both physical and mental effort simultaneously. It's not like we get to turn our brain off after we're done studying and start practicing. You gotta use your brain um, a lot when we're actually physically practicing. So I think physical practice by far the hardest of these three modes that we're discussing. And playing is the third mode that I want you to get familiar with. So playing is when we allow ourselves to step away from that struggle mode. And let's be honest, this is the mode that we're in 99% of the time when we play drums. We're just playing. We aren't digging into the depths of our mind to think about patterns or grooves. We're not thinking about uh, specific rudiments. We're not counting. We're quite literally just playing the drums. And I think that this is a really valuable tool if we know how to use this correctly. Again, we're gonna circle back and spend some time talking about all of these, uh, these three learning modes that we've discussed later in this lesson. Practice philosophy number three, your brain works like a clogged sink. If you've ever taken a behavioral science class, you're taught pretty quickly that the idea of cramming doesn't work very well. So cramming is when we take a short window of time and we try to smash as much info as we can 
into our brain. This usually happens in college because you have a test that you didn't study for. So you try and stay up all night uh, the night before and you cram all that information for the test in. It really doesn't work that well. But take a moment with me and I want you to think about a clogged sink. We turn the water on and we have some time before that sink is completely full. Now we know that eventually the water in the sink will go down, but we can't just leave the water running forever or it just overflows. Now your brain works the same way. We can put a good amount of information in your brain, but there comes this point, there's this line where we have to give ourselves a break and just allow your mind, your computer to process and render all of this new stuff that we've put in. We've got to let that sink uh, slowly drain. And I think this is a mistake that a lot of drummers make early on. We think that we can just sit down for four hours, five hours, six hours and just crank some something out. But even if you're in a rush to learn something, taking strategic breaks makes a huge impact on how well you actually retain the information. We'll get into this a little bit more later. Practice philosophy number four, you need to find out if you are top heavy or bottom heavy. Whenever I used to get a new private student, it was always my goal to find out right away if they were a top heavy or a bottom heavy musician. So the bottom is referring to your body. When somebody is bottom heavy, this means that they have physically worked out how to play a lot of different things that they don't fully understand yet. We call this bottom heavy because the bottom, your body, knows more than the top, which is your mind. Now when someone is top heavy, it's the opposite. It means that they know or understand more about rhythm than they can actually physically play. So for example, your girlfriend would be considered top heavy if she knows what a paradiddle is, but can't actually sit down and play it. So all of us fall on this spectrum of top heavy to bottom heavy somewhere. For about the first 10 years that I played drums, I considered myself to be very bottom heavy. I didn't know what I was playing most of the time, but I could still play a lot of different things. My body had all of this muscle memory built up from 10 years of playing, but I couldn't actually explain or even conceptualize what was going on rhythmically or mathematically. And then as I got further into education and I started studying the drums and rhythm a little bit more, I eventually switched to being very top heavy. And as of now, I'm able to conceptualize and even explain very advanced concepts, but that doesn't mean that I can actually sit down and play all of them. My mind is a little bit ahead of my body top heavy. Now I think everyone becomes top heavy eventually. As you get further into the study of rhythm, this is just something that happens naturally and I assume this is the case with all instruments as well. But if you're still very bottom heavy and you're playing things that you don't fully understand yet, it's not a bad thing at all. In fact, I think that bottom heavy drummers oftentimes can learn a lot faster because your body is so far ahead of the game as soon as you start to understand the things that you can already play, your body and mind will start working together. This synergy kind of happens. And this just compounds with all of those years of physical practice that you've already put in. So things tend to move along really fast for bottom heavy players. And practice philosophy number five, understanding recall versus repetition. If we think about how long it takes to fully internalize a new concept or learn a new pattern or a new groove, we could come up with a number of repetitions that it might take to learn that new thing. This will be different for everybody, but let's say that it's 5,000 repetitions. That's how long it takes for you to learn a new thing. So in theory, if you sit down at the kit and you play a new groove for 5,000 bars, you'll have it down really solid. But I believe that how we get to that mark of 5,000 reps matters a ton. In my experience, it's always better to spread those repetitions out over a much longer period of time. And I don't even mean uh, in the same day or over a week. I'm talking months sometimes. Each time we ask our brain to recall new information from scratch, we're carving out a neural pathway in our mind. And those pathways get smoothed out as we keep recalling that information over and over and over. But keep in mind that the nature of recalling something is that it only counts when you draw that idea up from scratch. You can't practice a pattern for three hours and say that you've been recalling the pattern the whole time. You recalled it once and then you practiced it for three hours. Recalling information is much more organic. Recalling a pattern is nearly impossible to do unless you leave some space and time for your mind to actually forget what you were working on and then you choose to bring that information back into focus. So if you've played a groove 5,000 times and you did that by playing the groove 1,000 times for five days straight, you've still only recalled this information a total of five times. But instead, if we play the groove 100 times per day for 50 days straight, we've now asked our mind to recall that same information 10 times more than if we just sat down and cranked out several hours of repetition. And I think there's a huge value 
in thinking of practice this way. Now, don't get me wrong, this makes taking on new concepts uh, much slower of a process, but if you actually want to retain the things that you're learning, this is by far the best way to do it. All right, guys, so these are my five practice philosophies. Now, we're gonna circle back at the kit and dive a little bit deeper into what this hour of practice looks like. And by the way, I am fully assuming that you have warmed up before doing this, so uh, if you need some help uh, warming up, definitely check out the Warm Up Masterclass. You can find it right here in the Masterclass Vault. All right, guys, let's do it. All right, so assuming we're fully warmed up, we're gonna get started with our first five minutes here. And our first five minutes of this hour is gonna be dedicated to studying. So uh, in this portion, what I wanna do is, is do everything but play drums. I wanna write out what we're playing. I wanna sing, I wanna count, I wanna clap. I want to just fully um, acclimate my mind to what we are about to start practicing. So step one for me here is just to physically write out what I'm working on. Now you might have a PDF or a video or a file or something already pulled up where the notation or the thing you're studying is already right in front of you. But I encourage you to go ahead and still write out what you're practicing. For me, over the years, there's just been such a benefit to handwriting things that I'm working on. It's just another way to let that information sink in my brain. So let me write out what I'm working on today. It's just a few bars of music, uh, and then I'll discuss with you guys what that is. So let's write out uh, what we're studying. All right, so I spent a couple minutes writing out what I'm gonna work on today. Let me explain what that is. Uh, and this is actually part of studying for me. Teaching or explaining out loud something I'm working on helps me internalize it a little bit better. So maybe you'll find the same thing is true for you. Um, sometimes it's cool to explain to your buddy what you're working on and you'll find it sort of uh, helps you internalize that information. So what I have going on here is effectively a basic eighth note rock beat. One and two and three and four and. But I'm focusing on my kick drums today. So I want my kick drum to come in on every fifth, sixteenth note. Now you don't necessarily have to understand what that means, but it'll be helpful to just remember that I'm working on uh, putting a kick drum every five sixteenth notes as that happens. So we could call this a five against sixteen polyrhythm. Um, and in this concept, there are five bars of music, but to keep it simple today, I'm only focusing on the first two bars. So if you check out what I have here in the notation, if we were to count by 16th notes, there's a kick drum on the downbeat of one. Five 16th notes later, our next kick drum happens on the E of beat two. Five 16th notes after that, it's on the and of three. Five 16th notes after that, it's on the uh of beat four. And then I have another measure that just follows sort of that, that same protocol. So we're only focusing on these two measures today. And I would encourage you to think of practicing this way as well. Just because there's some whole giant musical concept doesn't mean you have to dedicate your practice time to that big thing. Kind of like if you're learning a song. Your practice session doesn't have to be learning the song. Pick like a couple bars and focus on that. So these are the two bars that we are working on today. So in this first five minutes of studying, writing out the groove, that definitely counts as studying. Explaining the groove or teaching it to someone, whether it's to a camera or to another person in the room, that also counts as studying. But one last thing I like to do in this first five minute window of study um, is just count out loud the rhythm that I'm going for. So in this case, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna write out uh, 16th notes because that's really the focus here, even though we have an eighth note groove. Uh, 16th notes is how I'm determining where these kick drums are gonna go. So I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna write out one E and a, uh, two E and a, uh, three E and a, uh, four E and a. Uh. I'm gonna do this twice. One E and a, uh, two E and a, uh, three E and a, uh, four E and a. Uh. And what I'm gonna do is create a counting exercise. So this is gonna conclude how I'm studying this thing before I've even touched the drum set. So uh, the first kick drum is on one, I'm gonna circle that. The next one is on the E of two, I'm gonna circle that. The and of three, keep on matching, one, one, E, E, uh, and, and. Then that last one, the uh of four. We go to our next measure, downbeat of two, boom. E of three, and our last one for today, is going to be the and of four. So for this exercise, uh, I, I might clap, I'm not sure if I'll clap yet, I'm just gonna count for now. I want to vocally accent um, all of these circled numbers. So this is gonna help me draw attention to the notes that I'm gonna be hitting today with my kick drum. So I'm just getting my mind used to a five note spacing because I know I'm about to have to hear five note spacings a lot. So let's try this out. One E and uh, two E and uh, three E and uh, four E and uh, one 
e and a uh, two e and a uh, three e and a uh, four e and a. Uh. Let's try that again. One e and a two e and a three e and a four e and a one e and a two e and a three e and a four e and a one e and a two e and a three e and a four e and a one e and a two e and a three e and a four e and a. See if we can loop this a couple times in a row, just counting. One e and a two e and a three e and a four e and a one e and a two e and a three e and a four e and a. Ah, missed the loop. <laughs> one e and a two e and a three e and a four e and a one e and a two e and a three e and a four e and one e and a two e and a three e and a four e and a one e and a two e and a three e and a four e and one e and a two e and and a four e and a one e and a two e and a three e and a four e and one e and a two e and a three e and a four e and a one e and a two e and a three e and a four e and a Tough, very, very tough. What I'm finding is that, and this totally makes sense in a five note spacing here. What I'm finding is every time I nail um, that, that, that accent, it always feels a hair later than I want it to. I want it to fall on the downbeats. One e and two e and three e and four e and or even earlier than that on every third sixteenth note because I already know how to play that. That would be one e and two e and three e and four e up. Right, so it's a lot easier to, your brain is just gonna gravitate towards something that you already know in this window. So again, I'm just focusing on this five note spacing, hearing the, the new rhythm that I'm about to tell my body to work towards. Um, and for you, you might be working on something totally different. I assume you are. So say it's a, a fill or a groove. If it's a groove, I'm just going to literally sing the groove uh, and I'm gonna mimic it with my voice as close as I can. So let's say it was a groove, you were working on a basic rock beat. Boom, gat, boom, boom, gat. I would sing that and try to read along with the notation as slow as possible. Boom, t, ga, t, boom, boom, ga, t. Maybe we move those kick drums. Boom, t, ga, t, un, t, un, ga, t, boom, boom, t, ga. I would actually sit here for five minutes and do that while reading along the notation. And what I'm looking for here is I'm trying to identify problem areas. I'm trying to set myself up for the thing that I'm gonna have to put a lot of focus on. So for me, I know that I have to put a lot of focus on coming from, in this exercise, from the end of this measure, that uh, I bet I can survive this far, that first measure, but as I loop it around, I notice that there's no kick on the downbeat of one. So that's gonna be a problem more than likely because we're so used to putting a kick drum on the downbeat of one, so I'm leaving that out. And then I have a kick drum on the downbeat of two up here, right? That's not very normal unless we're playing four on the floor and we're not playing four on the floor. So I'm just identifying these problem areas that uh, I'm anticipating are gonna give me a little bit of trouble and it saves me some time because when I get there, I'm not gonna be confused, I'm not gonna be frustrated, I can go, oh, I already counted this out, I already sang this out, I know what this thing is all about. Let me slow down and really focus on this problem area. So. This is what studying looks like, guys. It is by far um, the most boring, the most tedious. You almost feel like you're not getting anything done because you don't have sticks in your hand and you're not really playing anything. But trust me, this is a vital part of starting out this hour correctly. So five minutes, seven, eight minutes, depending on how much you enjoy studying. Uh, but yeah, this is exactly what I would do for the first five minutes of our hour. And now we are on to practice. So the next 15 minutes of this hour are gonna be dedicated to my first window of practice here. And I say first window of practice because we're not gonna stay in this mode for very long. Again, 15 minutes here physically practicing this. So um, I've already sang out what I'm working on. I've already handwritten the measure. I'm pretty familiar with what, um, what I'm about to tackle, but this is just the physical part. So uh, we're gonna start out by just playing our groove exactly as it's written and see how far we can actually get. So let's just try out our first measure here at the top. I keep wanting to put uh, this kick drum here, the kick drum on the downbeat of three. For some reason, when I play an E or an upbeat, a 16th note upbeat right here, 
It makes me want to do more of that over here to keep it kind of hip hoppy and swung. So I'm finding that really landing on this white people note to the end of three is a little bit tricky. Everything else seems easy, but feeling this, um, it doesn't feel like it's supposed to go there yet. So uh, I'm gonna play around with a few different speeds and just see if I can find somewhere where I'm hearing a five note spacing instead of just blindly playing this groove, which is kind of what I'm doing now. So let me see if I can identify where this lives uh, and make it musical so it feels right. Ah, okay, that helps a ton. Noticing or paying attention to the fact that I have two solo hi-hats that happen right here. So the and of beat two and the downbeat of three are solo hi-hats with the right hand. If I can just hear both of those and then anticipate that right after that, the next hi-hat has that kick drum on it, that's the and of three, that should be a little bit helpful. So let me try and hear those two hi-hats there. Okay, so what I'm liking about this is that paying attention to these two hats here definitely helps me survive this measure. So uh, I'm gonna make a note of that. In measure one, um, so where are these notes? We have the and of two and the downbeat of three. And of two and downbeat, down, beat of three uh, are solo hi-hats. So what I'm hoping here is that by making this note, that in measure one, the and of two and the downbeat of three are solo hi-hats, what I'm hoping for is that this will not only help me survive this measure, I know it helps there, but I'm hoping it will come up in other places. And I can already see in my second measure, uh, we have kind of the same thing going on. So on the and of two, and again, the downbeat of three, wow. Okay, so this happens twice. It happens twice and just in these first two measures. So I don't wanna mess up my notation here, but right here and right here, very similar in that I've got these two solo hi-hats that can help me divide where the next kick drums might go. Obviously, we're stabbing in on a 16th note upbeat here, but I think that might be helpful. So this is something I recommend doing. When you find out little tricks, little, little things that you're like, huh, that's kind of cool, write that stuff down because not only will it help you um, remember the next time you're coming to practice this, but it also might come up again uh, within this same mode of practice. So let's try this one more time. Just the first measure here. See if we can get a little bit of time in on this. Now I probably have to be careful looping this around like that because it's turning into just the normal groove and I'm trying to learn a five note spacing concept here. So I don't wanna just loop that groove in itself. Um, just like if you're working on, let's say a fill or a groove, could, could be either, in like the verse of a song, you can't just loop that for like an hour because eventually it's gonna turn into its own thing. You need to learn it in the context of the whole song, or right, or in, in the context of that part of the song. So I'm gonna try and get away from just looping this first bar, see if I can connect it to our second Second bar. So let me drop the tempo down, play our first bar, and see if I can get to this, the downbeat of two in the second measure. I'm gonna try and survive this whole measure and see if I can land and stop right here on the downbeat of two to explore this transition from the first measure to the second and see what happens. That sucks, that's really hard. <laughs> Let's try this again.
So I'm playing it successfully. I'm making it to the downbeat of two, and I think I'm playing everything uh, correctly. Uh, the problem is I'm not hearing this musically just yet. It doesn't really sound like I'm doing anything cool. I'm not hearing a five note spacing. I'm just kind of blindly following what's going on here, and I need this stuff to sink a little bit deeper. So what I'm gonna do now is try and push further into that second measure. I'm gonna try and survive until the next kick drum. And I think of this a lot like like checkpoints in a video game, like in a racing video game. So my next checkpoint that I'm trying to survive to, that I'm trying to make it to, uh, will be the next kick drum. And this applies for a lot of different uh, fills, patterns, grooves, things like that. It's really helpful to pick a point within the measure of music and say, let me, let me get just to here. Let me get to the downbeat of two. Let me get to the end of beat three and survive that long. So I think about these kind of things a lot. Um, where is my next checkpoint? So our checkpoint for this example today, we're gonna make it to the E of beat three. That's where I'm going for. Let's see how far we can make it. From the downbeat of one, heading up to the E of three. Let's see if we can get that far. All right, so I'm, I'm getting there, but I can tell what's gonna be more helpful is actually just focusing on uh, this second bar music only. So let me start from right here, the downbeat of one in the second measure and see where this can, uh, see if this helps me hear this a little bit differently. I notice I'm getting lost in this transition, so maybe I'll return back to that transition. Uh, I definitely will, but let's just focus on the second bar here and see if I can make it to that same checkpoint. Okay, so let's see if I can get further than that. Maybe we'll go to the downbeat of four, so our last backbeat. Let's go that far. All right, we're getting there. Um, I'm feeling good with this bar. Let me add in the last kick drum on the end of four. Maybe we'll be able to loop just this bar. Let's check it out. All right, so a little bit of progress there. I still need to connect these two bars together, but I'm finding that in isolation, I made a little bit of progress just in this first few minutes. So I can definitely survive these measures individually. Now the challenge is transitioning from the first measure to the second measure. But not only that, it's also you know, making this musical and, and feel good. And really the only way I'm gonna make this musical and make it feel good is if I'm hearing the five note spacing correctly. I can't just blindly follow along and then expect to sell this thing or make it believable. It's kind of like if I asked you to give a speech on a topic that maybe you weren't that interested in. You can memorize the words of that speech and you can say those words, but you're not really gonna sell it to anybody unless you actually believe and fully understand what you're talking about. And drums, it's 
it's very, very similar, right? It's not just about blindly going through a robotic mode and, and you know, stomping the kick drums where they happen. We might have to do that for a little window of time, but for me, I need to make this musical, so I need to really start hearing these five note groupings, and I know that's gonna happen from transitioning from the first measure to the second measure. So, let's work on that transition. Uh, I'm gonna spend a couple minutes doing this, and then we'll move on, because I don't wanna make you guys watch me practice. That's certainly not gonna be, um, not gonna be too helpful, but, Let's, uh, let's give it a shot for a minute. So going from measure one into measure two, focusing on the transition, and I'm really gonna try and hear these five note spacings and how they connect uh, within these two bars of music. Let's give it a shot. All right, so obviously that wasn't quite 15 minutes. I think I did about five or six minutes there. Um, and what I'm focusing on is obviously the musicality, focusing on hearing that five note spacing. I'm also focusing on um, really controlling what's happening, not let any of those um, 
improvised like guessing notes happen where I'm just like, boom, it's, 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 yeah, it feels right. No, way, way more intentional, way more focused, way more dialed in. That's what makes this so hard. You, you can't let yourself um, sit here and have fun, right? Because fun doesn't look like this. Fun is me making things up and moving around and kind of experimenting and exploring. This is the opposite of that. I'm really, really dialed into these specific notes on this piece of paper, or it could be on a phone screen or whatever, but I'm not letting myself uh, run wild and play anything that I want. It requires a lot of discipline and self-control in these moments um, because you have to focus on the important things. Are you playing the notes correctly? Um, are, we, are we making things up and improvising, or are we really dialed into these dots on this piece of paper? That's what makes this stuff so tedious. So. That was a few minutes of practice. Again, I'm not gonna make you guys uh, watch me practice for 15 minutes, but uh, we've had our five minutes of studying, 15 minutes of practice, is, it would look something like this, and then we're gonna go on to playing. Now, the intention of playing for five minutes here is really just to wipe our mind clean. Can we play what we've just learned? Sure, if it comes to mind, but I don't want you reading the paper. I don't want you looking um, at this piece of paper or any of, things, any of the things that you've just studied. So we're gonna take this, set it aside, and we're just gonna play drums for five minutes. Now, if some of this material comes out organically, that's awesome. And that might happen just because you spent the past 15 minutes putting this information in your brain. So it's something that you can toy around with. But the idea here is, again, just to kind of cleanse the palate um, and just get, get your mind off of this and onto something different. So I'm not gonna play for you guys for five minutes, but let's jam for a minute and just clear our minds. So yeah, none of the five note grouping stuff came out of my playing at all. Not really something I was focusing on either, but it can happen, right? So um, you wanna watch for that stuff. As you start to input data, input data, input data, eventually you start to see some of those ideas come out a little bit more organically. That's not happening for me right now, but I know that it will because I've done this a million times before. So um, really alternating or toggling back and forth between practicing and playing, practicing and playing. It's a good way to start figuring out when the new idea is that you're learning begin to make their way into your playing because it's it's hard to know uh, when you've really internalized something unless you're you're keeping an eye on that new idea sort of popping up in your playing and trust me that will happen um, but it's it's easier to, to figure out when that starts to happen as you practice and then play and alternate those back and forth. But again, the, the biggest reason that we're just playing here is because it's helping us wipe our mind, just like that clog sink principle. We've already filled our brain for 15 minutes with data and input and information and thinking and processing and rendering. And now in order to, to let that sink drain and let that information just kind of um, soak in a little bit, we switch things up, we just play drums. Uh, and if something comes out, that's cool. That totally works for us. So we've had five minutes of studying. We've had 15 minutes of practicing. So we're 20 minutes in. We just played for five minutes. Obviously I'm not doing that on camera, but we've got five minutes of playing. So we are 25 minutes in. From here, the next five minutes to get us to the halfway point of our hour, I want you to do anything that is not drums. That could mean playing on Instagram for a few minutes. It could mean um, taking a walk or cleaning up your studio or your drum room, but do something else besides playing drums because this is really how we cleanse the palate and wipe everything clean. Now, after we take this five minute break, for the next half hour or the last half of this practice hour, I want you to do the exact same thing again. I want you to come back after your five minute break, uh, right at that 30 minute mark. We're gonna do another five minutes of studying. We're gonna clap and count out loud. We're gonna um, try to internalize this data, put it all back in our brain again. We're gonna do another 15 minutes of practice, the exact same thing. Or maybe if we are feeling comfortable, we can move a little bit further into the thing that we're studying. So go further into that measure of the groove or take on a couple extra bars um, of, the, of the concept that you're working on, if you feel you're ready to do that, right? 
So another 15 minutes of actual practice. Then we're gonna do another five minutes of playing. Uh, but of course you can make that 10 minutes if you want because you don't need to have the pause built at the end of this hour. Um, that would just be when you're, when you're done and you're walking away from the drum set, right? Now in all actuality, I don't need to go over this stuff again with you guys because we've already done that, right? There's no reason for me to uh, make you watch me hand write grooves again for five minutes and then practice again for 15 minutes and then you know, play for five minutes and then take a 10 minute break or whatever. Um, but just know that this is the loop that I put myself on when I practice. This is my self-improvement loop when it comes to learning things on the drums. You know, early on we focus just on the cognitive part. What am I learning here? Do I fully understand what I'm trying to learn? Can I count it? Can I clap it? Um, identifying those problem areas, that's your first five minutes. Then we go into practicing. You guys know exactly what that looks like. It's the ugly grinding part of practice. So we put in that physical time, try and teach our body some new skill sets and allow our ears to hear this new thing that's happening. Uh, then we're gonna play free form, just let everything go, five minutes, get loose, try and get your mind on something else and pay attention to um, if these new ideas that we've just studied, if they're starting to appear organically. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't, uh, but it's just good to toggle those back and forth. Practice, play, practice, play. And then we take a five minute break and we start this loop all over again. So this 30 minute loop, you can do as many times as you want. You can practice for three hours this way um, and just keep looping over this idea. You can also adjust the time times um, that you're doing each one of these sections. So maybe you like to study for 10 minutes or 15 minutes, and then you like to practice for five minutes or 10 minutes, right? You can amend all of these lengths of time to fit whatever works best for your learning style. Now you can also shorten all of these times as well. If you're in a jam and you only have 15 minutes or 10 minutes to practice, maybe you're just um, you know, with your coffee before you head off to work for the day, or maybe you got home late and you know, you've only got 10 minutes at the kit and then I gotta go to bed or tuck the kids in or do whatever you have to do. You can also cram all of this down into a short window of time. So you could study for two or three minutes, counting and clapping and writing your things out, taking a couple couple notes, then you got five minutes of physical practice, then we jam for two or three minutes, then we take a little bit of a break, let all of this soak in, maybe we do that one more time. So just know that this idea of studying, practicing, playing, pausing, and then repeating all of this, you can stretch this to fit any window of time that you might have, and guys, I promise this is a super effective way um, to get new material inside your mind and let your mind teach it to your body and get everything happening full circle. This is what I've been doing for years, guys, so it is extremely helpful for me, uh, and I hope you guys will find the same to be true for you.